Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is Fonas Free. I'm the National Chair of the Groundwater Division. Um, I will be the, the coordinator for this afternoon session. Um, welcome to our first uh, uh, groundwater talk of the Groundwater Division um, that is covering the topic of what uh, hydrogeologists need to uh, know about borehole design, uh, construction pumps, uh, VSDs and operation. Um, as you would see that um, we've got a, a great uh, lineup of two presentations um, this afternoon, and we would like to ask everybody to um, then mute themselves. If you have a question um, regarding the presentation, uh, please um, put it into the chat. Um, if you have, uh, if you would like to have a, a CPD certificate. Um, also uh, put your name and affiliation into the chat. Uh, we will have the two presentations and then we will also, right after that, we will have the, the, the question and answer um, uh, session. Um, just to have a quick introduction into um, today's topic, we are talking about what do ge geologists need to know about boreholes? Um, from the groundwater division side, we are um, receiving a number of requests um, relating to good um, practitioners in groundwater. Uh, where is our hydrogeologist? We we're looking for specific um, professional hydrogeologists. And that's why one of the things is that we've developed a database on the website that you can actually find the people that's qualified to do it. But um, the thing also comes into, you need to know how to do it, um, not just from a hydrogeologist side, but also from a client side, and then also from the engineering side of it. So if you're not starting to plan your, um, what you actually need, um, you will not get to the, the, the result that you're actually looking for as a client. Um, so we will go through the whole process of how do you plan? What, before you actually start drilling, you need to start planning what your end result must actually look like. Then through, the, through your drilling, you, how the construction must actually look like. How do you need going to do your, your grouting? Um, what type of casing are you going? What diameter are you going to use? So that's just a few things in the, in the drilling of it. And then right at the end, um, when you want to take out the water, what, what do you need to consider? And that's why it will be, uh, it's going to be great that Ruben is going to share that with us. Corneille uh, uh, Engelbrecht is going to uh, talk about the borehole construction and Ruben um, last year is going to talk about the, uh, the pump, borehole pumps um, and everything that's associated with that. So with no further ado, I'm going to ask um, Corneille to provide us with a, um, a short uh, the introduction or his presentation on groundwater um, or borehole construction. Take it away, Gordon. Thanks a lot. Great. Um, thanks so much, Fonis, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I see there's quite a nice, uh, nice dinner. So, firstly, um, I'm going to start off just setting the scene, a little bit of an introduction on drilling, uh, design and construction, and just really share my story of the last eight years being involved in the groundwater industry. Um, and it's really to set the scene for, for what's coming up after me, um, Ruben's talk. So um, yeah, let's, let's get going. So I thought it would be good to start off with a little bit of a collage, um, especially during the last five years. Cape Town, as you all know, had quite a serious drought. A lot of drilling happened. Um, drillers flocking to the Western Cape from all over the country. And just um, to take note, this is actual photos out in the field. It's uh, not from the internet. So yeah, just to quickly talk through them, show some examples of how not to do things. So yeah, looking at the first one year on the left down the whole camera log, PVC that's completely separated. The middle photo there, it's actually a first. I've seen some shocking field, things in the field. 
that was actually a first for me to see how that PVC was joined using some gutter plastic or, or um, plastic with uh, pop rivets um, protruding quite badly on the inside and self tapping screws, which is obviously not ideal. Looking at the second example, um, how not to slot PVC. So UPC PVC casing, um, solid section slotted on site with an angle grinder, not ideal. It's uh, And just as a note, sometimes this is installed in a primary aquifer, unconsolidated aquifer. And I mean, this is not going to do the job what it's, what it's designed to do. So yeah, not ideal. Another interesting example over here, um, if you look at the images over there, top left, you'll see there's a, some steel casing and there's a steel cable going in. And just below that, there's some PVC hanging in that ball. It's actually suspended on that steel cable. It's PVC is not all the way to the bottom. So yeah, quite a bit of a shocker. At the same site, top right, it's a reinforced concrete slab. You can see the hole over there and then um, bottom right. So this is quite interesting sitting um, just in the upper reaches of the Cape Flat in Balbo, in Balbo South. So um, for about 30 meters or so you have sand. So the driller decided it's a great idea to roll just normal air percussion. And when they got to 30 meters below ground level and they trucked away 30, three zero one ton skips of sand. At some point, they probably should have thought, listen, uh, where is all of this material coming from? Um, and they should have stopped the bus just there. So they blew out a massive cavity underneath the reinforce, the order, the concrete over there, and they struck driving. So the client actually had to get in the geotechnical engineer to come and sort this issue out. Um, so yeah, again, not ideal, wrong drilling method or technique. In, um, for this typical ge for the geological setting. Then just looking at this, the left, uh, the photo on the left hand side. So yeah, first proper um, factory perforated PVC, but you can see fines coming through. And that's because the incorrect gravel pack or filter pack was used. You can see um, the photo over there displaying um, the filter pack, which is actually Angular, this is just crusher rock. This is not a graded silica based filter pack, well rounded um, silica filter pack. So it's also, it's not doing the job what it's in intending to do or in to keep out fines, um, to filter out fine material um, from your aquifer. So, yeah. And then just looking at the, at the last set of um, issues encountered on the left hand side, it's the same borehole, the top and the bottom with steel casing actually um, ripped apart. So very poor welding. And actually between this, there's quite a big fracture zone. So you can just imagine the steel casing installed is actually not doing its job um, to, to uh, help with the structural integrity of this ball to keep it open. So it's completely failing. Um, same on the right-hand side, uh, something similar, steel casing, uh, pulled apart. So yeah, obviously some, some obvious construction issues with this. So just to move on then, I think it's good. Like I said, just a very quick introduction. Um, let's call it uh, back to basics. So first let's look at ball drilling method. So just quickly running through this, just to get a quick recap. Um, so first up, let's just start from the top. I won't go in too much detail through all of them. Uh, percussion or cable tool drilling. So this is the old method um, technique that was used probably by your grandpa. Um, not really used that often anymore. Um, so yeah, uh, mainly used, used in hard rock formations. Um, and you'll know in the Karoo, if you did some work or if you've been working in the Karoo, they talk about the Aster clip or the Aster bunk, that's really the dolerite. So this technique, it, it really struggled to get through to get through that. So um, secondly, DTH or down the hole, top hammer. Um, this is typically what we refer to as a percussion, mainly used in hard rock formations um, across the country. So uh, ranging in diameters from 75 to 450 millimeters and 
yeah, can drill quite deep of this. So mainly, like I said, hard rock formations um, to use the air percussion method. Moving on, direct circulation rotary, or as what we call uh, mud rotary, where you don't draw with air, but you actually draw with a, a drilling fluid with additives and mainly used in unstable formation. Um, so in your sand, prim primary aquifers, um, unconsolidated material um, can also be used if you look at, uh, at granite, where you have clay material, where you struggle to get through with normal air percussion, and sometimes even a casing advancement method like ODEX, to just first get through the clay material, um, this technique can also be used. And then same but slightly different, reverse circulation. So it's based on the same, same principle. And um, so you can you get reverse circulation air and um, mud rotary technique. Um, and it's all just to do with the with the direction of your of your um, drilling fluid, either like I said, air or your or your um, mud, the circulation direction of that. Also used for fairly large diameters, and again in um, unconsolidated material, soft materials, but it can also be used in um, hard rock formation slope technique, normally for um, larger diameters and for deep and can be used for, for deeper wells. And then there's uh, your dual rotary, sonic drilling, auger drilling, jetting, direct push, drive of well points and manual cons construction. But really, like I said, the top ones over there, DTH, and then the, the uh, rotary techniques, that's what we mainly use for groundwater, groundwater production balls. And then just very quickly, uh, just a couple of nice photos on the left hand there, for those of you who haven't actually seen it. So that's a typical example of a, a cable tool drill or a stamper board. Uh, the top photo in the, in the middle, um, this example of a DTH rig, um, normal air percussion, at the bottom, a typical setup of a mud rotary that was direct flash method, uh, drilling in um, unconsolidated material or in sand, primary aquifer. And then on the right, that's actually an example of a site where we used the reverse um, flash method. Also, um, um, the mud rotary technique. Okay, then looking at borehole casing characteristics. So there's certain things that you need to look at and think about when you're going to install a specific casing in the borehole. So you need to look at the diameter, what you want to do, what's the borehole going to be used for, and what's the site condition of that material. All of that play an important role in selecting your casing material. And you typically look at things like durability, strength, the jointing system, and chemical inertness of that specific casing. Um, and if you look internationally, they also might have national uh, regulations or specific specifications guiding you on what type of material you want to use. So just some, some photos over there, just durability. You can just think about uh, mild steel casing. Don't go and install a three millimeter low grade um, mild steel casing in an area where you have acidic low pH waters um, and the corrosion is high, that casing is not going to last for a very long time. Um, same thing, PVC casings have, um, have different classes just, take, just based on the, the external pressure or force it can withstand. So also make 100% sure that you, if you need to install PVC in deep holes, that it's a proper class, a proper wall thickness, um, to be able to withstand that pressure because the PVC casing can collapse. So important thing, same with the jointing system. So you typically get uh, threaded couplings that's normally mainly used in your PVC casings, welded joints for your steel casing, and then spigot and socket with key locks. Um, that's the another. That's the other um, type of um, mechanism that you normally get with your your PVC casing. So, like I said, very important. Think about what the ball is going to be used for and long term, and um, just also think about your your specific site conditions. Okay, um, as I mentioned previously, casing material. Just quickly running through all of this. 
So first up, we have mild or low carbon steel casing, um, stainless steel casings, PVC, high density, high density polyethylene or HDPE, and fluoropolymers, which we don't get in South Africa that, that um, often. Just quickly looking at some advantages and disadvantages of these. So your um, mild steel, it's um, quite inexpensive, rigid and strong. So um, where you need to do a bit of work with the casing to try and get it in that hole, um, it can take a bit of it can take a bit of strain. Disadvantages, as I mentioned, corrosion definitely an issue. So just plan ahead. Um, maybe go thicker wall um, or completely if you have issues. Know you have issues with corrosion. Rather change to something something different. Um, looking at your stainless steel casing. First advantage, probably the, the um, best one is uh, it's corrosion resistant. So something to something again to keep in mind. But the downside, it's quite expensive. And fortunately, in South Africa, a little bit difficult to get hold of. Not as easy as steel and uh, UPVC casing. So yeah, that's the downside of the stainless steel. And then UPVC casings, yeah, again, quite inexpensive. Um, it's quite light and easy to work with. But then disadvantages, it's quite sensitive to temperature. So um, if you've been on, on a draw site, 38, 40 degrees PVC outside, out in the sun, it, yeah, it, it needs to be laying out straight on the ground. Otherwise, it can bend. If it heats up, it can bend it, and you can have issues installing that in your, in your ball. And then also just um, another one, reduced strength compared to steel. Um, that's... That's another um, disadvantage of the PVC. So yeah, like I said, a couple of things just to keep in mind. Um, so if you're working, just to give an example of the previous slide and this one, if you are um, working on a contamination, so a contaminated site, and you want to install monitoring balls, most likely you'll go um, you'll go with something like a PVC due to the chemical inertness. You're not going to get um, you're gonna, not going to have issues with, with that PVC um, breaking down over time or anything like that. So like I said, just a, a little bit of planning that you need to do. Moving on, something that's quite important, um, borehole screen slot width and the type of slots that you typically get. So just very quickly looking at the table on the right-hand side, typical, and this we're talking about factory perforated, so not out on site PVC with an angle grinder, it's factory perforated. So um, looking at slot widths in millimeter, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1, 1.5, and two millimeters. So um, quite fine, and it all depends on the on your geological setting. If you in a primary aquifer and you have uh, lucky enough to have a uh, grain size analysis and you know the formation or the material that you're working with is quite fine, then you'll probably go with a smaller slot width. But if you're working in a secondary or fractured aquifer and the PVC will only be there to really assist in keeping open the formation, then you can go a one or maybe a two millimeter slot size, slightly larger. Um, great. So Something that really goes hand in hand with the with the um, slot size is your filter pack. Um, so yeah, quite important to note that um, it actually plays quite a big role in um, in filtering out, keeping out fine material. And you really want to go with a graded, well-rounded silica-based filter pack. And typically, um, with the silica content of larger than ninety-nine percent. So just reason why we're using silica obviously it's quite inert it won't break down over time and you want a nicely well-rounded material not angular um, to have proper packing of that material so that you can't have pines coming through so you get this in all ranges or in grade uh, grading sizes um, ranging from very fine grade 0 0.075 to 0 0.3 all the way to four to nine millimeters and Typically, um, in uh, in the Cape Flat or primary aquifers, we will go. If you want to be conservative, we might have a bit finer material. Um, you'll typically use um, a 0 0.5 millimeter perforation size um, and a 0 0.6 to 1.5 
um, graded the filter back, um, like I said, just to, to make 100% sure that you don't get any fines coming through into your wall. And as I mentioned, um, grain size uh, distribution or, or, or grading of your fines. So the way to select your screen and filter back um, is actually quite a process that you can go through. Um, if you're lucky enough to actually have some material uh, of your aquifer that you can send in to, to properly design your screen and your filter pack. So first do a grain size analysis to get your grain size distribution. Um, and then you want to just determine um, if you want to go with a, a D50 uh, or if, meaning 50% uh, passing grain size or a D30 or 30% passing grain size, which is quite conservative. So that's basically just looking at your aquifer material, the percentage that your filter pack needs to uh, retain or keep out your, your aquifer material. And when you're looking at your specific slot size um, of your screens, you really want to try and um, retain 90% or more of your filter pack. So like I said, quite a process. We can probably have a whole discussion just about this. Um, but like I said, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have uh, proper samples, this is definitely the best way to go to ensure that you don't have any issues um, with your screens and with your filter pack selection. Just very quickly, um, looking at the different casings now, and then just very important, and this is going to um, be important when, when I hand over to Ruben a little bit later, um, just talking about diameters and why that's important and proper planning is needed when you start off with, with the whole process. So let's just first quickly start off with mild steel casing. Um, when you, where we have in the table over there, left hand, left hand column, outer diameters. Um, on, the, on your right, um, the, last, the last column over there, wall thickness. And in, in, the, in the center, you have your inner diameters. Um, and obviously that will differ with different wall thickness for a specific set of uh, set of casings. So just quickly running through this from the smallest 152 millimeter outer diameter all the way up to 600 millimeter um, OD and typical wall thickness of, of casings, um, three, 4.5 and six millimeters. So the typical casings we use in South Africa is uh, your seven inch or the 177 OD mild steel casings and like I said they come in typical wall thickness of three 4.5 and six millimeters so you can just see if you use a 177 casing and you have a, a standard four and a half millimeter wall thickness your inner diameter will be 100, 168 millimeters so like I said just something to keep in mind when we talk about pumps um, and operation a little bit a little bit later on. And then your 219 millimeter typical ODEC size or casing advancement that we use. And then larger casings um, normally used in large diameter dewatering holes or just shallow um, for to use as a starter casing. Then very quickly moving to uh, your UPVC casings. And again, same um, on the in the table over there, the first column just showing your outer diameter, your uh, the last column showing your um, wall thickness, and then in the middle your inner diameter. Again, you get a whole different um, different sizes in your PVC. Starting again, um, you even get smaller than this. But I really just kept this um, to be applicable for production boreholes from 110 millimeters all the way up to 400 millimeters. And your typical um, PVC that's used and um, really fall in the range of um, if you're drilling a larger diameter in a primary aquifer, or um, then you'll probably go a two to five or a 200 millimeter um, outer diameter. If you go in a hard rock formation and you really want to keep uh, install PVC, if you have some issues with collapse or, or some fines coming through at a fracture, maybe then you're looking at something smaller like 165 or even 140 millimeter. And again, now this is very important um, just to mention this. So you'll see in the wall thickness, there's different, um, if we, let's take for example, the 140 millimeter, you have a 4.8, a 6.5 and an 8.4 millimeter um, wall thickness. And that's really linked 
to the class of that BBC. As I mentioned um, earlier, it's, it's uh, graded for different depths that you want to install this. So please don't go and install a class nine a PVC in a 200 meter borehole, that's not going to work. You're going to have issues with um, the structural integrity of the PVC, it's going to fail um, and the borehole won't be usable. So, um, yeah, keep that in mind. And specifically for PVC, you do get issues with um, reduced inner diameter. So, that can be quite a bit of a problem. So, think long term, think in advance how much water, what the typical use of the borehole will be, will it be monitoring, will it be production, and how much water do you expect to get out of this in a sustainable way going forward. Um, like I said, this will really link to what um, Ruben's got to say a little bit later on. Um, so yeah, with like I said, typical, typical sizes that we use over there. So um, then quickly moving over to ball development. And this is a crucial phase of the drilling process. Uh, normally comes at the end when you've uh, finished up your borehole, when you've completed your borehole. Um, very important to clean, to, to develop. Um, that's the term that we use to develop that borehole. And there's mainly two basic reasons for development. The first one is removal of material that plug the aquifer during the drilling process. Um, for example, wall cape, drilling mud and cuttings, that must be removed from the hole. And secondly, the removal of smaller particles in the natural formation around the ball to increase the permeability near the ball. So um, there's mainly two methods that we use. Air flush development, normally mainly used in, uh, in um, secondary or fractured rock aquifers, where you use compressed air, can be 20, 25 bars, um, and you, and you basically just flushed all out to get the fines out and to clean it and then air lifting, which we always recommend when you're sitting in a fracture or in, in a primary or um, unconsolidated aquifer, you don't really wanna go with very high pressure in there from a compressor because you can damage um, your, your filter packing, um, which you don't really want. So, so a lot of care must also go in, in installing a proper filter pack to make sure that you don't get any bridging or any gaps to make sure that the filter pack and your screens are really keeping the fine material out. And if you go in with a very high um, bar compressed air, you can develop some issues. So airlifting is just normally a dual pipe uh, method and you basically really, let's call it sucking out the water rather than just blowing it out um, in quite a violent way. So important poor ball or development can reduce well efficiency so that's really important that we get that we get right so just you know looking at something slightly more technical and um, planning for artesian conditions so very very important this can be a huge headache um, if you don't do this and you get artesian conditions so um, very important that you look at this so firstly understanding the flow and pressure where's the potential artesian zone um, what if uh, there are multiple zones and do you um, do these zones have different heads? So understand the system as a hydrogeologist. It's not complicated. Um, look at the geological setting and understand what's happening over there. Um, and then this is where really grouting comes in to, to be able to control those flows. So planning adequate seals. Um, when is a test valve a good idea? When do you want to drill a pilot hole to get an idea of what's happening um, and then don't sit with a production borehole where you didn't large diameters, where you didn't plan from the beginning. It can be a bit of a headache. Uh, have a clear and feasible plan with an alternative plan. So sort of on the fly, if you go and something goes wrong, that you can quickly sh um, change up and make sure that you do with that um, be or be able to do with that on site. Have an emergency contingency plan with sufficient budget. You don't want to sit in a situation where you have artesian conditions, there's a problem because there's no money, the client will, won't pay for this. Just from the get-go, make it clear that we might have issues with artesian conditions and properly plan and design for that. Then uh, the correct and reliable equipment and material on site, and then very important, uh, be able to control that artesian flow. That's crucial because uncontrolled artesian flows can have long-term impact and possible legal implications as well. So you're yeah, very important, like I said, as a hydrogeologist, understand the system, your geological setting, um, know when you have confining conditions and might have um, 
artesian artesian um, conditions prevailing so yeah basically the conclusion in the words of benjamin franklin if you fan if you fail to plan you're planning to fail so uh, really like i said just a quick very quick recap on uh, on drilling so yeah at this stage um, i will give i will give over to i will give over to um, ruben to um, yeah take take it further from here Thank you, um, Cornet, for, for the presentation. Yes, as you said, Ruben will do the, uh, say what we're going to do next in the sense of after you've developed it, uh, what will be the pump, uh, what type of pumps you are using and so forth. Just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, put it into the chat. Um, and then also um, this week, uh, two presentations are being recorded and will be available um, within the next few days. Um, and then if you still would, um, would like to receive CPD points, um, please put your name into the chat with your name and affiliation. Um, as we going into, we in a new cycle, um, I think everybody is keen to, to, to gather their points. So um, thank you, Corne. Um, and then I'm going to ask Ruben for, to share your screen and then take it from there. Thanks, Ruben. Fantastic. Honest, can you just confirm, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see it. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. Um, good day, everyone, and thanks, Cornel, for that fantastic talk. And I will literally just be taking over right where Cornel left off. Um, and we will be looking at designing and equipping a ball with the end goal in sight. And I think that um, that phrase that Cornel left at the end uh, is a very good introduction um, and uh, idea that we should always keep in mind when it comes to, to balls and especially designing balls. There we go. Um, our first slide here is it's just a, a diagram showing a ball from the side and from the top. And uh, on the left hand side, we have the, the cross section of the ball showing all the, the typical um, parts that, that goes into the abstraction equipment that goes into the ball. We have our pump, our riser pipe, electrical cable, a whole bunch of cable ties. Um, and then something for us as hydrogeologists, something that's not in that, that, that diagram, is an observation pipe, uh, something that often gets uh, left behind when it comes to designing, designing a bore. And then on the right-hand side, we have a, a top cross-section of a 140 millimeter OD PVC uh, bore. Uh, if we look at the, the brown outside, that is our PVC with our water. And then we have our four-inch pump, which is the typical pump size that will, or actually the largest pump size that will be able to fit into this ball. We have our uh, riser pipe, observation pipe, uh, electrical cable, and then a safety rope. And what I want to, to show you with this diagram is just a small amount of space. Uh, this has been drawn on to scale, and a small amount of space that is left in the ball once all of that equipment has been installed. If you look at the observation pipe, we can already see that is actually crossing over this diagram of the, of the PVC wall, which would suggest in this wall, in a practical sense, that this pump will have to hang all the way to the side to accommodate for that observation pipe. Now imagine a PVC bo um, uh, inner casing with an ID of 110 millimeters. And often the case with those 110 millimeter PVC casings, maybe a pop rivet or two, or a self-tapping screw also entering that ball in that same space. Just imagine the little amount of space uh, to actually install that pump or to lift that pump later, which is normally where we, when, where we inter uh, interact with the problems. But let's look at ball sizes and pump sizes and how they relate to each other. We typically have two size pumps that in commercially we use uh, on small scale. So, uh, in South Africa for our farmers, most in industrial processes um, that just use groundwater for, for their processes. Um, and we typically have two, two pump sizes. We have four inch pumps. Their diameters go to about 101 millimeter, 102 millimeter. And they typically go into the minimum ball size of 127 millimeters ID. Like mentioned before, they can fit into 110 millimeter ID. But as indicated by the previous by the previous diagram, that is not the best idea. When we look at four-inch pumps, we look at um, 
single phase and three phase. Single phase goes up to about 2.2 kilowatt for our maximum pump sizes, and they can produce about 4.4 liters a second at a head of 30 meters. If we move over to three phase, we can go up all the way to 7.5 kilowatt pumps that can give a flow rate also of about 4.4 liters a second, but at an increased head of approximately 90 meters. Once we go over that, we go into six inch submersible pumps. They have a diameter of approximately 152 millimeters with a minimum bore size of 165 millimeters ID. Uh, like Cornet Corne mentioned, uh, when he looked at the different PVC and, and, and steel casings, this is where we need to consider. Right in the beginning, when we install the casing, we already need to consider the pump we want to install. And for three phase, uh, we can go up to 37 kilowatt and, and uh, maximum uh, realistic rate of 26 liters a second. Some people will say uh, that this um, is, is not entirely correct, but for the norm, uh, this is what we look at. Uh, you always get larger pumps and, 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 and for, for large diameter balls, but your standard 165 or, or uh, seven inch, like May mentioned, all the way to our eight, nine and 10 inch balls. This is what we are looking at. We must also note, that for instance, if we have a 165 millimeter ID, we cannot expect to install a 37 kilowatt uh, motor and, and get 26 liters a second because just the diameter of the, of the casing itself will already drastically decrease the rates that we will be able to get from that ball. Next, I wanna talk about riser pumps, uh, something that, that a lot of people never think about because we just look at the pump size and uh, that's all good. As a pump can go into the hole, everything else is fine. Uh, so I'll quickly go through the four uh, most common riser pipe types and some of their advantages and disadvantages. Starting with steel pipes, uh, this used to be the common pipes in most of the older balls, especially if we start looking at wind pumps and so forth. And they have some really good advantages. For instance, they're strong, they've got really thin walls and collars because of the strength of the material. Uh, the steel pipe can be used as, as an earth for a submersible pump, essentially limiting the, the amount of wires that goes down the bore from four to three. Uh, they are quite rigid. And why that is an advantage is, uh, especially if a pump gets a little bit stuck, you have the ability to push down on the rods to move the pump a little bit down and then back up. Disadvantages, they're prone to erosion and rust. So if we have uh, balls of low pH, uh, we often see that there's quite a bit of erosion on these pipes. And then lastly, they are heavy. Uh, installing them, you need quite uh, large equipment that uh, can handle the weight. Uh, they're difficult to travel with, and ultimately the amount of weight that hangs on your, uh, on your ball construction is, is, is quite a bit. Then secondly, we will move to bore quip, my personal favorite uh, type of, of riser pipe. They're also quite strong. They're lightweight, they're erosion resistant, they're rigid, uh, same same advantage as with steel. However, they're not uh, as rigid as steel, so there will be a little bit of flex, especially if you go to your, your lower classes. And then uh, just one disadvantage, in my opinion, is that it's quite thick-walled, and uh, especially the collars are quite thick, and they are prone to, to get hooked on a poorly installed uh, a steel casing or, or PVC casing. Next, we will move to HCPDE pipes, a uh, very common pipe. Very nice to install, especially for, for lower uh, or smaller diameter pipes. Uh, advantages, strong, they're cheap, and they're flexible. So uh, for someone with a, a pump in the backyard, it's nice to, to have HEPDE. It can easily be pulled out um, with maybe a winch or, or three strong guys. The disadvantages, it's extremely difficult to handle if the diameter of the pipe goes over uh, 40 millimeters. I don't know if any of you had to lift a 100 meter um, a pump hanging at 100 meter with a 50 mil uh, HEPDE pipe. It gets extremely difficult to lift it up as either that pipe has to go 100 meters up into the air or you need to find a way around you to, to move that pipe. Uh, another disadvantage is to use huge couplings. If you look at the, the blue coupling over here, this is typically uh, what we look at. The inner diameter there, that is what will go around the outside of the HEPDE pipe leaving a massive blue cap uh, that can, can get hooked on a lot of things. Another disadvantage is they're flexible. So should your pump get stuck, you are only capable of pulling, um, as pushing down will only twist the, the pipe in the ball. Next, we go to bore line. Um, 
a very controversial uh, type of, of riser pipe, in my opinion. And the only advantage is that it's easy to install and to lift uh, with several disadvantages. The first one is the wear and tear that it goes through. As soon as uh, you start using it, the, the motion of the pump in the ball um, just starts twisting the pipe. And we often see tears and cuts in the pipe after short durations of, of, of use. You also have huge stainless steel couplings. Um, yeah, often get caught if not uh, removed correctly. And then as with all the others, it's flexible. So should the pump get stuck, you cannot push down on it. Now let's look at how to get all of this information from a ball. Should we do a hydro census? We need to maybe test that ball in the future or we need to find out what is the approximate yield. But all we can see is, as in this picture, uh, a ball from the top. What things can we look at to give us some clues of, of what we expect from this ball? Starting at the casing size. If we can manage to get under the base plate, and measure that casing size, we can immediately tell if it's a six inch or if it's a four inch pump. Um, well, should it be a four inch pump in a large ball? Uh, then we obviously miss out on that, but should the ball be smaller than than, uh, um, than 160 or 150 mil, we can be sure that it's a four inch pump. Then we can look at the riser pipe coupling. Normally you cannot see the riser pipe from, from just looking at the bottom, but often you can see the coupling. So should it be a blue um, compression fitting, then we can comfortably say it's HCPDE. Um, can we see maybe the top coupling of a, a um, QPVC or bore quip or even a steel coupling? This already gives us a type of a, a size of the pump, as it's a small pump, it will most likely be HCPDE with larger um, three meter pipes like the, the steel or the UPVC uh, for your larger pumps. Then we can look at a general pipe size. Uh, again, normally your foot four inch pumps go up to uh, pipe sizes of a maximum of about 63 millimeters. As soon as you go 63 and up, you can be uh, sure that it's a six inch um, pipe ah, pump. Then we can look at our flow meters. What does a flow meter generally tell you? Each flow meter should have a, a, a brand or a, a, a label on them. And by just Googling that, it will give you the range that that flow meter can uh, um, handle. That already immediately limits your, your, your yield of the ball, not the yield, but the abstraction rate of the ball to within that range should the, the flow meter have been installed correctly. You can also look at the electrical wire. Um, that normally is the, this green color um, that powers the pump. The thicker the wire, the larger the pump. Uh, for instance, as soon as you go to six inch pumps, you can think about uh, five, six centimeter diameter for those wires where your single phase is obviously a, a much smaller uh, three wire um, electrical wire. And then lastly, we can look at our electrical breaker. Normally electrical breaker that powers these pumps looks like this, and it should have an amperage that where it kicks off. That amperage can be converted to a kilowatt, and that will give you a good idea of what size pump is in there. And later on, we will look at how, how that can give you a really good idea of what uh, the abstraction rate from that ball is. And then just a disclaimer, please don't open any of those electrical boxes if you don't have experience with them. Now let's look at what to consider when designing an abstraction system. I have a small example here. Um, of ball that's five liters a second for eight hours a day, uh, dynamic water level at about 44 milligrams uh, meters below ground level, and a pump depth at approximately 16 uh, meters below ground level. And here we can see exactly the same ball, but two examples. We have ball one, where our tank is at, at 60 meters above ground level, and we have ball two, where we have a dam at zero meters above ground level. For ball one, the pump will have to overcome initially the 20 meters of the static water level plus the 60 meters of the tank above ground level. However, as water as the water level increases to the dynamic water level, where we as hydrogeologists uh, expect the ground, uh, our water level to end up, we will look at a head that the pump needs to overcome of about approximately 104 meters. However, ball two, where we have a static uh, a, a dam at, at, at ground level, the, at a dynamic water level, the pump will only have to overcome the 44 meters of head um, if we only consider our elevation head. This is all part that we need to consider in the beginning of the 
of the design process of the ball when when we install our casing for instance if the user wants a, a flow rate of of, of uh, four liters a second uh, at his tank at 60 meters and we install a ball that can only allow for a four inch pump we know that we will be able to get that rate quite easily at ground level but we also will quickly know that we won't be able to get that rate at the tank level so let's look at at system curves system curves is, is essentially a visual representation of the full system and what it does is it allow, allow us to look at the amount of head that needs to be overcome by the pump to achieve a specific flow rate so normally when we do yield testing we will recommend a client he can pump five liters a second for like i mentioned eight hours a day for instance and what we will do is we will look at our full system including all the possible head losses that we can can find this will be elevation head um, we, it will be friction loss will be from the from the pipe sizes pump uh, pipe types uh, it will look at all the the fittings um, but we will come to this a little bit later and how a system curve essentially work is we will start at your horizontal line here we will look at the rate that we want from the ball we will move up to our system curve and then we will see the amount of head that the pump will need to overcome to achieve that rate. Um, and essentially how this works is as soon as we change any uh, head in the system, for instance, we close a valve or we open a valve or we change the pipe size um, within the system, this curve will either move up or down. For instance, closing a pump, ach, a tap, the curve will move up, opening a tap, the curve will move down essentially that for the same rate with an open tap the pump needs to overcome a smaller head to achieve that rate this one over here is a very nice example of a tap uh, being open and closed and now we can see how many different curves we can get by just opening and closing one well within a system friction losses friction losses essentially that the friction that gets added by that the, the, the pipe inner um, surface uh, any fittings by changing the direction of water flow, reduced, uh, reduced diameters of pipes. So if we look at this, here, for instance, we have a, a, a pipe diameter change, so we're going to a smaller pump. Here we have friction of the inside of the pipe. For, for instance, your PVC will be much smoother than steel, where steel is, has a much rougher surface. So we expect a, a much higher friction loss uh, because we use uh, steel pipes. And then any valves, or bins all adds to this system. So now that we know how to uh, design a, a system aid, or at least how to consider a system aid, we need to start looking at what pump uh, do we need and how do we look at that. And for to do this, we will look at pump curves. A pump curve is essentially uh, a diagram showing at what rate or at what head a pump can give a specific rate. So if we consider the diagram on the right here, we will have increasing head on your y-axis and increasing flow rate on your x-axis. Um, and this will be different types, each uh, different pumps. Each pump will have a different curve. And then ultimately the circles is the efficiency of a pump. To use a pump optimally, you want to use it in the zone of highest efficiency. As you move to the left or to the right of the curve, you move off the, the the optimal area of the pump and you start getting much higher power usage you get much more wear on your on your bearings and on your fittings and on your propellers and you sh ultimately shorten the lifespan of your pump so how do we look at this pump curve and understand it very similar to a system curve just the other way around from the system curve for a specific flow rate we got a specific head need that we need to overcome now we look at the pump curve we look at a specific head and then we will see what flow rate we will get at that head. This is a nice example of, of, a, of a pump selection chart. And essentially what it does, it just provides you with a whole range of, of pumps on one chart, and you can ultimately select the best pump for your system curve. If we look at the bottom, we look at the kilowatts, as well as the efficiency of the pump, the orange line provides you with the zone of best efficiency. And I just moved it up with these red lines. See, this is where we want to operate our pump within this range and and on the right hand side of the chart we just see 
that, that essentially just mathematically in a table showing at what depth, what, what head we can expect, what yield from the ball. Ultimately, these comes with a dimension of weight for the pump as well. So it gives you the motor diameter as well as the lengths um, and weight of the pump. This will essentially assist with designing the, the type of riser pipe um, to be strong enough to handle the weight of the pipe. It gives you the diameter of the pump to know in what size ball you can install it and several other aspects that we can consider when designing. Now to bring the system curve and the pump curve together to ultimately do a pump selection. And how we will do this is we will literally put the two curves over each other and we will find an operation point. Operation point is where our system curve and pump curve meet to achieve a specific rate at a specific head. And just some, some lingo that I want to add um, to, to give you a little bit more context of, of, of what the engineers think of when, when they uh, design pumps is the best efficiency point. Um, this is ultimately the point within this efficiency zone. The carry out, carry out is where we move all the way to the far right of a curve and we move to very poor efficiency. Um, then the shut off head is essentially when the, the head of the, um, of the system exceeds the possible head that the pump can achieve. And essentially we have no flow. And once we are in that process, we say that the pump is in churn. So when, we, when we talked about that, I can just hear in my head, everyone saying, but why do we have to care about this? We just put in a massive pump and a VSD and all our problems is solved. So let's look a bit at VSDs and, and how we can use them optimally and what is their actual purpose. So VSD is, is or a VFD is a, a variable frequency drive. And essentially what it does is it increases the or decrease the frequency of the pump and that essentially affects the, the RPMs of the, of the pump. And RPMs is revolutions per minute, so essentially how fast the pump is turning. Um, this diagram is, a, is an example of a, of a pump curve. In this case, this is not different pumps. It's just one pump. Um, and we will see as we decrease the RPMs, the pump curve is moving down on the diagram. If that was our system curve, we will see we will meet it at different places on that same curve. And just some advantages of a VSD or some features of a VSD changes the frequency, like, like I mentioned, and that changes the pump speed. Um, but ultimately, it also decreases the power that, that gets used, uh, also decreases the max head, um, and then it shifts the, the pump curve, like I mentioned over here. So what is the advantages of, of a VSD? It reduces the startup current allows for automatic system control. And why I say it allows for it is because it does not do it on its own. It easily, easily adjusts the pump frequency or speed. It allows for energy saving and it increases the pump lifespan ultimately um, if you run the pump a little bit lower than the max. Some disadvantages, it's expensive. Uh, if used incorrectly, and when I say incorrectly, I mean very slowly. So essentially you install a massive pump, but you pump much lower than, uh, or flow rates much lower than, than uh, its recommendations, you start causing wear on its bearings and seals. And then also this advantage, it does not do automatic system control, like I think a lot of us think it does. Just a little example on, the, on this graph over here, uh, if we look at a VSD um, and a pump curve, it does not change the flow rate linearly with the change of RPM. If you look at the curve, uh, the, imagine this is the pump curve. If we ch change the RPMs here, we will have a massive uh, change in RPMs, but a very low change in flow rate. As soon as we pass this section and it, the curve actually starts steepening, we will see for very small change in uh, RPMs, we will have a massive change in flow rate. So just to note that it's not always a linear system. So let's look at I'm going to look at about four different ways of using a VSD. And the first one will be looking at a VSD as a standalone unit. And I kind of related it to a tap or a valve, as it's very similar in function, just with some different advantages and disadvantages. For instance, if we close a tap in a system, ultimately what we're doing is we're changing the head, lifting up the, the system curve, and this results in change in flow rate. But it also results in a change in pressure. 
Should we close the valve, the pressure in the system will increase. However, with a VSD, changing the RPM will form uh, will result in change flow rate, and uh, but the head that the pump uh, or but the head stays the same. So we won't be changing the pressure in the system like with a valve. Just to explain that again, if we use a tap, we will move the system curve uh, up and down. But if we use a VSD, we will ultimately you change the pump curve up and down. The next one is just a diagram showing what we can expect from water levels and flow rate should we use a VSD as a standalone unit. We can expect a very high drop in the water level initially as uh, for, for the VSD as the as the flow rate uh, is ultimately still high in the beginning. As the water level decreases at a specific RPM, we will see that the flow rate will also decrease. Um, and ultimately we will reach some form of equilibrium where both the water level and the flow rate will stabilize. Should we use a VSD in a pressure control system? A loop where we have a ball, we have an electric uh, pressure, um, reader we've got our plc or a control box and we have our bsd but what we want to do is we want to keep a constant pressure this we find often from engineers where uh, they have a specific either a treatment plant or a pipeline that can only accept a certain amount of pressure but we have four or five um, balls pumping into that same system it becomes very complicated i added this picture because i think only engineer will understand what what's happening with those pipes um, and for us as an engineer, as a hydrogeologist, the system where we have pressure control is not ideal because of two things, variable flow and variable water levels. So ultimately within the ball, we will have no stability. As soon as the second pump turns on into the system, the first one will have to react to that, decreasing the flow rate, um, ultimately have, causing fluctuations in the water level. The next is the system we will look at is a VSD and water level control loop. This is where we have a pressure transducer in the ball. Uh, we set a specific water level where we want the water level to stabilize or to be uh, often maybe at, at our expected dynamic water level or maybe the max, maximum water level that we can achieve. Uh, same system, we have our, our ball, we have a pressure transducer that talks to our PLC, which in turn turns, talks to our VSD, which regulates the motor. And what we can expect from that, if we look at our flow rates and our water level, is that the water level will quickly drop down to the set point of the of the um, of the VSD or of the pressure transducer, and it will fluctuate over it until it finds stability. However, the flow rate will do something similar. As the water level drops, the flow rate will drop because the head that the pump needs to overcome uh, will will change, and the flow rate will fluctuate in a similar manner. Ultimately, we won't be able to know exactly where the flow rate will stabilize, except if the pump is exactly spec to, to the specific water level that we chose. So if we use the, the or if we change the water level set on the system, we can expect the flow rate from the pump to change as well. And lastly, we will look at a VSD in a flow control loop. This is where we have, again, we have a flow meter, our PLC, a VSD, and we have our ball. What will happen then is we will set a specific flow rate and uh, we will look at the water level, how, how it responds. So ultimately our flow rate is gonna be stable, for instance, five liters a second, and our ball, uh, our water level will slowly decrease until it reaches a natural dynamic water level. I normally prefer this system uh, for reasons that for the user, we have a constant flow rate, um, we know that that we will always get the same amount of water from the ball and uh, that will not fluctuate through seasons and we can ultimately design the process or the system that comes after this much more accurately for instance a treatment plant or um, just the, the ultimate the, the amount of water we need in, in whatever system we also reach a dynamic water level which is nice and stable um, without needing to to fluctuate that water level as in the water uh, level control system. And yeah, just in summary, to design a system, we really have to understand the system prior to doing anything. We need to look at the system requirements prior to drilling even. Uh, we need, need to know what is our client's requirements, how much water he needs, 
and uh, what extra work will be, or what extra systems will be between the end uh, use of the water and the pump? Will there be treatment plants? Will there be, uh, will it pump to a dam that's 60 meters in, in, uh, at high elevation or uh, into a reservoir that's at the same, same elevation as, as the surface level? Then we need to design a ball correctly with the, with the correct pump size and equipment in mind. For us as hydrogeologists, we always need to remember our observation pipes. We often see a bore being drilled, and then we can only install an observation pipe of about 20 mil ID, which means we cannot install that fantastic solidness loggers that we normally want to install in there. We also need to incorporate all head losses into our pump uh, system. So when we design that pump, when we size that pump, uh, look at all the different fittings we're going to use, look at our pipe sizes, look at our um, pipe types, uh, or is there going to be booster pumps, and, and where are we pumping? And ultimately, we need to select the pump control system based on the full abstraction system with the ball durability in mind. We need to think uh, what is what, what will get the ball to be as stable as possible. Are we going to ha have issues with iron in the ball? So should we look at a system that's pumping continuously and how will that look different from a stop start system where we only pump for four or five or six hours a day um, and what will be best will we need to uh, regulate the flow uh, will we need to regulate the water level or will there be a very complex system where engineer requires us to regulate the pressure from the system great thanks everyone Thank you, Ruben. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, very, very informative, the same as Courtney's presentation. Thank you very, very much. Um, I just want to remind everybody, any uh, questions you can put on the chat or you can um, just uh, just raise your hand or open your mic and you can ask the question. Yes, I see, see uh, Adolf uh, October, please ask uh, your question. Just a, a question to Ruben. Under the that VSD flow control loop. Can you control the water level under those conditions? Um, ultimately, you will not control the water level directly, so you will control the flow rate. However, um, the water level should reach a, a stable dynamic water level um, on its own. As, as modeled within the yield testing, should the ball have been yield tested correctly. However, you can incorporate two systems. It gets, it gets quite complicated um, when you do that. And, and often what I would recommend is to uh, use the flow control system, but use a water level control system as a additional um, extra uh, precautionary measure. So essentially that system will only kick on once you read reach a specific water level so your dynamic water level will uh, will reach above the, the the specific depth that your your water controls uh, water level control system is, is is selected on um but should something goes wrong and the water level drops a specific depth uh the the water level control system will start kicking mm, thank you yeah. thanks a lot uh, for that question Adolf. um in your own in your Anybody else that would like to ask a question for the two? I think uh, this one of the things that uh, we always struggle is to to get the link between the hydrogeologist and the engineer. And um, and I think one of the things is that we've that I've seen a lot is that after you've done your planning, um, you will um, you've done your planning, provided to the engineer, and then if you come back you will see that there's maybe something uh, totally different installed. Um, and then you actually need to go back to do the operational side of it um, to give the, how much you actually need to pump from each bore up. Um, that is what I've seen. I don't know if you've any comment on that. Honest, that is definitely the case. Um, but I also think uh, we as hydrogeologists also want to give over the project as soon as our report has been sent. So as soon as that yield and quality report has been sent to the engineer, uh, we often tend to, to sit back and wait for the end result. Um, and I feel we all have the responsibility to be more involved and to work with, or walk within a closer relationship with our, with our engineers and um, make them also understand what we, we require as hydrogeologists. Um, and I think education is very, very important there to really uh, try and get engineers to understand what stable conditions within a ball means for a ball 
and the durability of the ball and uh, ultimately their system as well. And uh, if we can walk that that road with them, uh, it means that we need to understand their systems as well as they understand ours. Um, but ultimately, we can definitely overcome that that problem. No, I uh, totally agree with that. Um, I see that there is some comments coming in from, um, from in, in, on the chat. Um, tell us, can you just maybe open your mic and then ask the question? I can, yes. Good afternoon, all. Thanks to Gios and to you, Finus, for hosting this um, rather important event. It's, it's great. So, yes, education is key, and it's awesome that many other people learn the fundamentals, Delph. Just two quick comments um, for consideration. So there's, to the previous question, there's using a VSD opens up uh, many different control loop functions from keeping a ball at constant level to keeping a, a, a tank at constant level, constant flow, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many variables to play with there. But one of the things I learned late in my career is uh, the caution around VSDs and like Ruben correctly said, operating them too slow. Um, and, and here's why. So ball pump motors require sufficient cooling velocity over them. Now, believe it or not, even though the motor is submerged in water, they can overheat and burn out. Um, what we find a lot of the times is if the pump motors are operated too slowly, we get insufficient cooling and the motors burn out around it. So um, a VSD doesn't give you full range, but just be careful when using it. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Teles. I was uh, I was hoping you would comment. I know you're the expert in this field. I was also a little bit uh, afraid of what you might ask. But, but well done on <laughs> putting the, the, the basics and fundamentals of it together. Great job. Thanks, Teles. Right. Um, any other questions? Just a reminder to fill in the poll as well as to uh, put in your information. Yes, Adolf. Yes, ask the question, please. Adolf, you can go ahead. Oh, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Yeah, just another pumping question. The system curve and the uh, pumping curve, how uh, does that uh, impact your, your sustainable yield calculator? Because you calculate the sustainable yield, and now you've got the system curve and this pump curve. How does that change the overall calculation of the sustainable yield? Is? Thank you, Adolf. Um, so ultimately, we will start at our sustainable yield. Um, However, I also want to mention with the sustainable yield is not always the, the yield that the ball will be abstracted at. That's definitely going to be the maximum yield. However, if the requirement from the client is different, that will, is the yield that we will uh, be working with. So say um, the client requires the full sustainable yield of the ball. Uh, we will ultimately, when our system curve has been designed, use that flow rate to determine the head that the pump needs to overcome. That head, we will then move over to our pump curve uh, for a pump selection to get a pump that can get, again, the sustainable yield at that specific head. So that's where we overlap those two, those two curves, the system curve and our, our different pump curves, to get a specific uh, working point. Um, and that working point will tell us what is the head that the pump needs to overcome for our sustainable yield. Uh, if we can spec our pump as close to that as possible, uh, <clears throat> it'll be best as that will mean the pump will be running in within its uh, optimal efficiency. Often we might get a pump slightly bigger, like the layer said, uh, we don't want a pump that's much bigger because then we will be running it too slow, which brings in a whole bunch of other, other problems, but we might get a pump that is slightly bigger um, just to allow us, uh, as normally a pump's efficiency goes down with time, so it will, will give the pump a little bit of, of, of uh, room to, to, to just achieve that rate over the long run as well. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, thank you. There's a question from um, Chris too in regards to the um, regulations that's um, from South, the department that is been um, been uh, developed. Uh, so, Christy, you can go ahead and ask, ask your question. Then we'll get to Raven. Okay, thank you, Farnas. Um, I just wanted to mention that the uh, department and national office, they're currently working on the draft regulations for drilling. 
And I just wanted to know more by the Department of Water and Sanitation from your office if the concepts presented by the two presenters are they being considered in the draft regulation? And additional to that, um, when will this draft be published for commenting or presented for commenting? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Christy, for the question. I know maybe I need to put on my, my different hat, um, um, put my Department of Water and Sanitation hat on. Um, so, Christy, uh, no, they, it is not being considered. Um, or not being incorporated into the regulation. The regulation is, is still in a development phase um, and there is no specific timeline associated with the regulation at this stage, um, but uh, we hope that that will be completed within the next uh, two years um, in a sense. So there's no, uh, it won't be developed uh, or gazetted very soon. It still need to be a, a long process that need to follow. Um, um, I see there is a, a comment from Karl Berger, um, but before that, um, uh, Raven, uh, can you maybe open your mic and ask the question? Hi, Forrest. It's, uh, it's more comment than anything else. I think great to see these types of um, uh, presentations making it onto this, this kind of a platform. And um, this is the type of material that actually needs to get out there into the public domain so that, uh, you know, planners and government and municipalities all our engineers can actually see that, yeah, you know, we're not only there for sitting or sighting of a bottle. Hey, eh? we can do yeah. a hell of a lot more. There's a, there's a, there's, there's great science to what we do, and they need to yeah. see that as well. I think it all, it's all actually aiming or the the purpose of our involvement is to actually create sustainable schemes. You know, at the end of the day, and to understand that everything exists in a balance. You know, and we need to be very mindful of that. And it's not yeah. simply dropping the pump into the ball and, and pumping the life of it out of it. Everything has to be managed so that it's it's it lasts us in the long term. That's yeah. just a comment. No, yeah, thanks a lot, Raven. Uh, I see that there's a comment from Carl, uh, Carl Berger. Maybe you can open your mic, Carl, if you're here. Um, uh, just a just a comment on the question on the um, sharing of the 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 recording. Yes, the recording will be shared. Um, it will be available on our debrief um, on the, our Groundwater Division website. So please keep your eye open for that within the next few days. Uh, Carl, if you're here, you can open up your mic and ask the question. Seems to me Carl is not here. Um, then, Kez, if you are here, you can open up your mic and ask the question for Cornet. Cool. Uh, thanks for the presentation, guys. Um, my question was just sort of to do with the efficiency of the borehole. Um, it seems like hypothetically we could have a situation where we have a poor efficiency borehole. So the water levels drop very quickly, but still a relatively high yielding aquifer. And so my question is, can we end up in a scenario where our supply boreholes essentially run to pump inlet while there's still sufficient water in the aquifer? And would there then be cost implications to that or financial implications to whoever requires that water just as a result of poor drilling construction? Yes, uh, <clears throat> thanks for that, Kev's uh, fantastic question. Yeah, definitely. So that can have some, some serious implications, practical and financial. Obviously, if, if you have uh, incorrect, incorrect construction or whatever, and you have issues, issues with your well efficiency, your pumping water levels will actually be a lot lower than uh, what's in your aquifer. So it's not representative of actually what's going on in your aquifer. So just implications in terms of that, um, you will need to abstract for a longer period of time. You possibly can't get the volumes that you're planning to get out of that borehole. So um, yeah, definitely, like I said, uh, long-term practical and financial implications to that. And that's why it's crucial to get it right, to get your construction right, to understand what you're doing, um, so yeah, I hope that uh, sort of answers your, your question. Mm, great, no, thank you very much. Um, I just see that there's another comment from uh, on the chat from uh, Kevin Peterson around the, the gazetting of the, um, of the regulations. If it's not a regulations, it can be brought in as a guideline. Um, the WRC is busy with the guideline development um, in this space. The first bias would be regulations. Um, yes, uh, we totally agree. Um, 
I think the one of the, that's one of the um, our director general from the Department of Food and Sanitation's idea as well that we need to gazette some of um, the guidelines that's been currently developed. So that's that's uh, on the on the way, um, and hopefully, if we can't gazette it, that we at least put it in some sort of a regulation or um, that refers to the specific um, uh, guidelines or best practices. Um, and that would also be another like second prize, but um, very good to have that as a regulation so that we can get the industry up to a specific standard that everybody can be um, be be basically um, active on or implementing when they're doing implement doing drilling um, and installation that they're doing it up to a specific standard. Um, I'm not seeing anything, uh, any other questions? Um, Honest, uh, there's, a, there's, a, has a hand there's a hand from, uh, I don't know, Christy, if your hand is still an old hand or Lick's hand, uh, but otherwise I'll take uh, Paul. Um, Paul, you can open your mic and then you can uh, ask the question. Thanks, Paul. Good day, everyone. For Farnes, there's a question to the regulations. Are they going to include the oral design for groundwater monitoring also for and also for groundwater dewatering? Um, Paul, yes. Um, I think that's that's very good suggestions that we need to incorporate. Um, and I think that is good that you are mentioning. I'll make a note and give it through to the people that's actually doing the regulations. Um, that would be the first price to actually incorporate um, just from exploration world to um, monitoring to installation. Um, I think that is a very good suggestion. I will I'll give that through. Thanks. Any other questions from anybody? Don't see any hands coming up. Okay, questions coming through. Then I would like to, oh, there's one. Uh, Kevin, you sneak in. Yeah, right yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got the last question. Yeah, no, no, no. I think it's important, Finest. I mean, coming back to the issue of regulations, and thank you very much to Kona and Ruben uh, for your presentations. It was great. And I think fundamentally what, what they presented is, is fundamental to operation and maintenance of groundwater schemes. If those things that I've mentioned is not done properly, eventually down the hill, down the road, uh, the the the, the infrastructure fails and communities and people are left without water. So my plea is that, that really there's an urgency towards uh, adopting, adopting and, and working on on these regulations because um, we, we see what happens in municipalities and the implications of, of, of proper work uh, not being done. So I, I find it very difficult to understand why why these type of uh, best practices and knowledge is not um, is not gazetted because that's the only way that we're going to get people to start uh, following uh, um, best practices or good practices. Thank you. I totally agree. Um, and then the last comment and question comes uh, goes to uh, Robert. Thanks, Farnas. Can you hear me? Yes, you can go ahead. Farnas, uh, these regulations, I'm intrigued. How are they going to, what's their relationship uh, to the SANS 10299 series? Um, I think that is precisely what uh, the regulations is. Actually, there's a lot of good um, guidelines already. Let's say the, the, the uh, water sample, groundwater sampling guideline and those type of regulations which basically would start referring to those guidelines and saying you need to comply to the SANS guideline uh, um, standards as well as to the Water Research Commission um, sampling manual um, and so forth. So that would be the, um, the essence of the regulations. Um, and then also uh, at one stage, they will ask starting to get to a point where we're saying, we, before you start drilling, you need to get a number so that we can get the information that need to be uploaded onto the National Groundwater Archive. Um, those are the type of regulations that we are currently looking at. Um, but uh, yes, that's still in its um, infant stage. So uh, we'll, I'll definitely give it the message through to the relevant section to make sure that there would be a good uh, stakeholder participation um, or consultation process involved when this will uh, going out for, for Gazette. 
Cool. Thanks, Juan. Okay, great. Then um, I would like to, oh, there's a, another question from Quinton. Um, Quinton, you are sneaking in. I would like to close. You will. <laughs> I actually, <laughs> apologies. I thought I'd quickly just ask the question. I think it's probably directed to Cornet, but um, it's regarding monitoring wells and boreholes and if they've been blocked, collapsed or installed incorrectly. Do you guys think it's better to redraw the well on its current spot and does that affect the efficiency of the well or is it just you know financially more viable to install a whole new ball close by and then on a regulation point of view is that in the regulation the um what's the word i'm looking for basically closing up these balls that aren't being used decommissioning it Quinton, yeah, thanks for the question. So I think there's a couple of things that you need to um, look at or think about if you're specifically talking about monitoring well. So first thing, um, if there's PVC installed, um, in which we normally do for, for monitoring wells, it should be small diameter. So if it's a permanent blockage, um, sure, you've got a battle to get that open without damaging the PVC, that casing. So um, the chance of getting that right might be quite slim. So uh, then it might just be better to, to do a complete redraw of that borehole. But if it's only steel cased open construction monitoring borehole, I mean, there's definitely drillers don't always like uh, putting their tools down, down existing holes, but you definitely do get guys that, that will do that and that will go out and clean it out. Um, like I said, so there's a couple of things to um, just first think about before you do that, but um, yeah, I sort of hope that answer that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's just, you know, I, I saw some of the casings that you represented in the beginning and you think, you know, all the guys install these weird looking boreholes and I'm assuming that they're going to be inefficient. So, um, you know, to some of our clients that, you know, would like you to come and reinstall these wells, is it worth trying to pull out that casing or if it's PVC casing, just drill through it? and reinstall the well, or do we just propose a whole new hole? Yeah, that's a bit of a 50-50. I mean, um, yeah, we've been involved where we had to retrieve a bit of rubbish casing, PVC casing. Um, like I said, it's a bit of a gamble. It, it can be done, um, but there's also a couple of things that you need to think about there. If it's really badly collapsed or um, anything like that, then you probably won't be able to get it out. And I mean, it just makes sense to look at look at it from the get go. How much? What's the chance of failure of uh, doing that, and how much it will be to to completely just redraw that? And just on your efficiency question, yes, it can definitely hamper that. We've got some great examples um, where incorrect drilling methods, construction was used in uh, in different aquifers where it's uh, you know, actually interesting to see. And I'm you know, doing a bit of research on that. Um, how it can definitely influence your efficiency. So, um, yeah, some 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 interesting interesting data out there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, th thank you, Quentin, for that question. Um, then I would like to um, say thank you for Cor uh, Cornet and uh, Ruben for the great presentations. Thank you for coming forward, um, and for the um, Cornelius Riemann. That's the um, Groundswater Division um, representative for the Western Cape. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that if you really would like to see some additional uh, presentations or have an idea of your presentations, please contact your um, your branch representative. Um, and um, and I think this um, uh, was also um, inspired by the um, the the. the the IH um, SA's uh, um, three-day workshop that we had last year. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, well, it's, well, it's two years ago already, time flies. Um, so yeah, definitely we would like to, to see you guys with our next talk. There's a next talk, I think it's um, within the next two, three weeks. Um, please go to the website, register, and then you can um, actually see uh, what, what's, what's on the events that's coming up. Thank you very, very much for all, everybody that participated. And, uh, and please, we'll keep the chat open for you to, if you want to ask a question that we can forward directly to the presenters. And if you still want to have your CPD points, 
certificate, please just put your name and affiliation on, on um, the, the chat. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.